of Joshua chapter 24. I'm going to bring, going to look at some familiar verses tonight to most of us, but I want us to think about this. And Joshua chapter 24, look at verse 14. The Bible says, Now therefore fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and in truth. And put away the gods which your father served on the other side of the flood and in Egypt and serve you the Lord. If it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom you will serve, whether the gods which your father served that were on the other side of the flood, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land ye dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. There was a definite decision that was made by Joshua. And I like here how Joshua phrases this here to them. He says, you need to choose who you're going to serve. You need to choose which side you're going to be on. He gave them some choices here as, as well. You'll notice there in verse 15, choose you this day whom you will serve. It's not a question of if you will serve. It's a question of whom you will serve. Everybody's going to serve somebody or something along the way. And so the question is, is who are you going to serve? Notice he says, you have the choice of the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the flood. That was prior to going across over the Red Sea. That was back in Egypt, and uh, they had some who picked up some of the gods in Egypt, and they uh, were more comfortable with them. That was that part of that crowd that always was looking back and saying, let's go back to Egypt. Let's, let's go back to the leeks and the garlics and onion. I don't know if you like that kind of, gar uh, that kind of diet or not. I do not, uh, but I don't know why. They kept looking and wanting those things. They always brought those three things up for some reason. But they had their minds back in Egypt, the, uh, the world there. And so they, he said, you, if you want to go and you want to serve them, then go ahead and choose those gods and go back. Then he gives them another choice. He says this here, or, or the gods of the Amorites, in whose land you dwell, you've come across the Jordan River, you've come into the victory side, if you will, and God has done a wonderful work for you, and you've seen him uh, conquer your enemies. He's, he, he's taken care of Jericho. He's wiped out Ai. He's, he's got, uh, taken care of all those different uh, people along the way. And yet here he says, if you want to, you can choose to serve those that are in the present land here. But notice what he says, but as for me and my house, Joshua didn't take a vote in his house. It was not a democracy in, in, in Brother Joshua's house. It was a, uh, it was a uh, you're going to follow my lead. And he said, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. There was a choice that was made, and he said, this is the side we're going we're to find, we're gonna find ourselves on. And so he puts it out to them. And you'll notice in verse 16, the Bible says, And the people answered and said, God forbid that we should forsake the Lord to serve other gods. And they go through and they, they give out their, their whole reasoning here. And, and Joshua, he, he challenges them on their, on their decision. He says, you can't serve him. Now, most of us, you know, uh, we, have, we get a good response from everybody. And everybody says, yeah, we're going to go do that. We're like, all right, let's go. Joshua doesn't, doesn't do that. He says, no, nope, you can't do it. Well, that's encouraging, isn't it? You know, our, our kids come back from camp. They have all the decisions and everything else. And they get up and they give their testimonies. And they get all done, and Brother Lucas gets up here after the end and says, none of you guys are going to do it. You can't do it. I'll be like, what? Uh, that's not what you're supposed to say. Did they teach you that at Crown? You know, we're like trying to figure things out with that. You know, that's not the right answer. But here's, notice what Josh was doing here. You cannot serve the Lord, for he is an holy God. You can't just enter into this decision flippantly. It's not just an emotional decision. We make a lot of decisions on emotion. And he's saying, you can't just make an emotional decision. Why? Because God is holy. God is jealous. And you make a commitment to him. He expects you to follow through with your commitment. Now, was Joshua trying to keep them from going forward and, 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 and following God. No, no, no. He wanted them to do that, but he wanted them to count the cost before they made that decision. In other words, here's what Joshua had done. Joshua had taken the time and he had considered the cost of following the Lord. And then he made the decision as for me and my house. Now he made the announcement, but he had already long made that decision a long time ago. You go back 40 years, 50 years, 60 years, and there they are standing on the banks of the Jordan. 
they come back with the great report and the ten spies say, we can't go in, there's giants there, they're going to kill us all. And there's Joshua and Caleb saying, no, 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 we can go in, we can do this here. The Lord will take care of us. He'll bring us in. He'll give us victory. Way back there, Joshua had already established the fact he was going to follow the Lord. Joshua stayed close all through the wilderness wonders. You know, he could have went through that wilderness grumbling and complaining and cursing every single one of those people that refused to follow the Lord because he should not have been there. But that's not what he did, did he? What did he do instead? He served Moses. He got into the tabernacle. He got close to see God. And he got a little bit of, uh, got to see a little bit of what God could do. And he understood that, that God was real. And, and he had seen God do wonderful and great things. And yes, there were some difficulties. And yes, there were some trials. And yes, there were some hardships. But he knew this year, God always brought them through. And Joshua's decision was born out of watching a life lived in front of him and Moses and following the Lord and then him following those footsteps and it, him taking that, that, what was Moses' faith, if you will, and making it his. And what he was doing was he was passing it down to his family. Joshua at this point is somewhere around 100 years old, 110 years old. He would die at 110. He's in those later stages of life, but he's already made a decision. And his decision that he's, he's proclaiming is one that is backed up by a life that has been lived. I wanted, a lot of us, we want to proclaim what we believe before we actually live out those decisions. A lot of us be, be, would do well to make those decisions and start living them out before we go running around saying, hey, look at me. Yeah. And that's what Josh was doing here. And he's giving them this challenge. <coughs> Excuse me. Notice he says there, verse 20, if you forsake the Lord, serve strange gods, and he will turn and do you hurt, consume you after that he hath done you good. He's giving them a warning here that you need to make sure you're careful with this here. Joshua, his entire life has been spent going out and doing the things of the Lord, serving the Lord, teaching the people the things of the Lord here. Uh, these years as a leader, that's what he has done. He's at the end of his life, and so he's given him these last few things. Now look at verse 22. Verse 21, I'm sorry. The people said unto Joshua, Nay, but we will serve the Lord. And Joshua said unto the people, Ye are witnesses against yourselves that ye have chosen you, the Lord, to serve him. And they said, We are witnesses. Now therefore put away, said he, the strange gods which are among you, and incline your heart unto the Lord God of Israel. The people said unto Joshua, The Lord our God will we serve, and his voice will we obey. So Joshua, here we go, Joshua made a covenant with the people that day and set them a statute and an ordinance in Shechem. Now turn me over to the book of Judges, if you would now. In the book of Judges. The book of Judges tells us that Joshua passes off the scene. And after Joshua passes off the scene, there's a bunch of elders. Who's the elders? It's those who were Joshua's contemporaries. They had watched the Lord work. They had seen what God did in the land. They just watched Him drive out the uh, Amorites and the Amalekites and the Hittites and the Hivites and all of those ites along the way. He watched them, they watched them do it. They watched God be faithful. They had walked through the wilderness as well. They were those who were 20 and younger. They had watched God do great things. They had watched God's judgment. They understood who God was and they knew He was worthy of their service. He was worthy of their, of their lives. And so they had lived their lives for Him. But in Joshua, I'm sorry, Judges chapter number 2, the Bible says this here in verse 7. And the people served the Lord all the days of Joshua and all the days of the elders that outlived Joshua who had seen all the great works of the Lord that He did for Israel. Skip down to verse 10. And also that generation were gathered unto their fathers. And so that whole generation that had lived with Joshua and then had come up there and had watched, been under Joshua's leadership, well, that, that whole generation now has passed on. Verse 10, he says, And there arose another generation after them, which knew not the Lord, nor yet the works which he had done for Israel. What had happened? What happened there is that somebody had dropped the ball somewhere along the line. 
the, the, the generation of Joshua, all those who had lived under Joshua's leadership, uh, those who had watched the Lord do great and mighty works, they, those who had watched the Lord drive out the enemies from them in the promised land there, and now that generation is all gone. And then there comes up another generation. The Bible says that generation that came up, they didn't know the Lord. How is that possible? How is that possible that a generation could come up that doesn't know the Lord? It's very simple. The problem is this here is that somebody didn't follow what the Bible taught. In the book of Deuteronomy, Moses told the people of Israel that they were to take the, uh, the law that God had given to them and they were to teach their children. It wasn't up to the priests to teach them. It was up to the parents to teach their children the law of the Lord. They said, whenever you sit down, teach them the law of the Lord. When you rise up, teach them the law of the Lord. When you walk by the way, teach them the law of the Lord. They were supposed to constantly be looking for opportunities to reinforce biblical principles all along the way. It was the job of the parents to make sure their children knew what the Lord said. The Bible says here that there arose another generation after them which knew not the Lord, nor yet the works which he had done for Israel. Somebody dropped the ball. Joshua taught the generation that was with him. He taught them what the Word of God said. You go back to Joshua 24. That's what it's all about. He's, he's going through. He said, hey, we're going to serve the Lord. I don't know what you're going to do, but we're going to serve the Lord. He had lived his life and he had given his life to teach them the Word of God. All those elders that were with him in that same uh, time frame, they had given their lives to teach the Word of God and to make sure the Word of God got passed down. And they had done all they could to make sure that next generation got it. But that next generation got it. And somewhere, I don't know if it was that generation or it was the following generation, but somewhere along that line, they failed to take what they knew and to give it to the next generation. There was a failure to hand off what they knew. And this evening, I want us to take some time and consider for ourselves this thought here of, of making sure that we get the message passed down to the next generation. It's up to us. I, I'm excited for our kids to go down to camp. I, I, I've, I've only gotten to hear Brother Paul just a few times, but every time I've heard him, it's been wonderful. It's been tremendous. It's been great. I know Randy uh, really well. I mean, I, I know his life backs up his message. Man, I'm excited for them to get to hear Randy uh, Taylor Jr. again this year. And I'm excited uh, for them to, to go down there and to get that. And I'm glad that we've got some adults who are taking some time off to take the kids down there and to uh, try to do what they can uh, to do this here. But can I tell you, one week of camp isn't going to do it. Uh, listen. You can have your kids in Sunday school, Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, church, and you can do all you can to have them in church, but that is not enough. Listen, if it's not going on in the home, then it's not going to be real to them. Listen, thank God that we've got Sunday school teachers who work hard to prepare lessons, but if you're relying on the Sunday school teacher to make sure your kid knows the Bible, you're going to fail. You're going to fail. Listen, I, I worked with teens for 15, 16 years, and I've seen way too many of them come in, and the parents just say, go to youth group, and, 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 and Pastor Wilson, he'll take care of everything, and, and he'll make sure they get it, and they'll watch them fall off. The, uh, all, as soon as they uh, turn 18, they leave church, and they, they turn their back on everything. They say, what happened? Uh, why'd you do that? I'll tell you what happened. It wasn't there at the home. It wasn't real. We, we come to church and we put on do those things here. And so, and that's what Joshua is saying. Listen, it's not enough that it's just me. Listen, my house, I'm making sure my house follows the Lord. I'm making sure my kids are getting the message. I'm making sure they're going to do what they're supposed to do. I'm making sure they know what God's word says. But that's me. I don't know what you're going to do. But that's what I'm doing. And he did everything he could to pass it down to the next generation. But somewhere... Somewhere along the line, somebody dropped the ball. 
And we've got to be careful that we don't let the, uh, the ball get dropped. Uh, thank God that we've got people that are taking uh, groups down to a place like camp. And, and thank God we've got a, a camp meeting going on down in Campbell next week. We can go and be a part of it and enjoy that. But listen, uh, whenever it gets just to the mundane, day-to-day, everyday things, listen, we've got to take advantage of those there and point our children, uh, point our, our people to Christ and, and point them to the things of God and make sure they know here's the right thing. Hey, by the way, they didn't know when it's not the right thing too. And why? It's not just, well, uh, well, when I was a kid, that's not the way it was. That's not good enough. Just that, that's called it, that, that, that's taken from second opinions. And that's not in your Bible. And that's what we're wanting to do. Well, well back when, you know, well, this is, the, no, no, that's not good enough. Listen, take it in the Bible. Hey, why is all this gender confusion stuff wrong? You should take them to the Bible. You show them, hey, God created male and female. He created them. He's the one who established that there. You don't have to be a biologist to figure it out. It's real simple. And listen, we can take them to the Word of God and show them that, listen, God does not approve of those things that we call alternative lifestyles in this day and age. We can look at Romans chapter 1 and we can show them from the book of Romans chapter 1 that whenever they chose not to be thankful for the things of God, God then turned them over and they be, all these things began to happen because we rejected God and we pushed God out of our society. Is it any wonder where we're, where we're at in our society today? We are bearing the fruit of turning away God. And by the way, it's been a couple generations now and we're watching the devastating effects and it's no longer just out there. It's, in, it's, it's, it's crept into the churches now. So-called churches now are now embracing this stuff that is anti-Bible. What has happened? We've let the ball drop. And listen, it's important that every one of us in this room, that we do all we can to make sure that we pass it down to the next generation. Not just, hey, this is how you're, what you're supposed to do and how you're supposed to think, but this is what the Bible says, and therefore this is why we do what we do. Because here's the thing, our opinions always change. I was listening today to a, a broadcast, and they were talking about <clears throat> back in the 60s, how the Democrats and Republicans there was very little that, that was different between the two of them. They talked about this wing of the Democrats back in the 60s that was forming, and, and they, were the, they were referred to as the new left and, and the direction they were taking them. And now we see they're so different. And unfortunately, it's becoming more and more where the Republicans are becoming more like the Democrats. And that which is <clears throat> sacred, that which is of the Bible, is being rejected by this day and age, and we're getting real close to the time where if you're going to believe the Bible, if we're not already there, you're the oddball. Even here in conservative southeast Missouri, we're becoming the oddballs. We're no longer accepted, and we're no longer looked at mainstream. Listen, is that going to be enough to move us off of what the truth is? I hope not. I hope we got enough to us that we've got enough Bible in us that we're going to stand strong. But what about the next generation coming up? What are we teaching them? What are we giving to them? Not just on Sunday, but what are we giving them on Monday? What are we giving them on Tuesday? What are we giving them on Thursday, Friday? Are we taking the time to hand those things down? Listen, here was the problem. We had one generation who was actively making sure things got handed down to them but there was a generation somewhere that got apathetic. Hey, they got what they, what they needed. And hey, they were enjoying the blessings of God. And so, but they, they weren't concerned about making sure the next generation got it. They just kind of sat back and said, well, who am I to tell them what they're supposed to believe? I just need to let them make their own decisions. That's not what Joshua said. Joshua said, uh, little Joshua, little Joshua Et, here's what we're doing, and you're going to like it. You're going to follow what Dad says. And he was a leader in his home to make sure the right response came along, but the Bible says there arose a generation who came in who did not know the works, and, and somewhere along the line there, that generation did not receive those things that happened. And now all of a sudden, what has happened with this here? Notice here. In verse number uh, 17, and yet they would not hearken to their judges, 
the Lord has sent uh, uh, judgment against them, but they went a whoring after other gods and bowed themselves unto them. They turned quickly out of the way which their fathers walked in, obeying the commandments of the Lord, but they did not so. A generation that went from being, uh, being proactive and making sure they got it to a generation that became apathetic towards making sure the next generation got it to now we've got a generation who's turned atheistic. We don't believe in the true God. We'll, we'll, have a, we'll worship all these other things along the way that aren't really God's. We'll, we'll put those things in our life instead, and we're going to just go that way. And God's like, no, you belong to me. Hey, I need your attention. And God began to send judgment, and God would uh, send things along their way, and they would turn to the Lord for a little bit of time, and He would send a judge, He would deliver them out, and then as soon as they got their way and they got comfortable again, they just went back to the old stuff. And all through Judges, we have this cycle. Just this cycle of, uh, of repentance and then deliverance and then going back into sin. And then a judgment. And then repentance. And then a judge would come and deliver them. And you just have this over and over and over again. What happened? It started with a generation that wasn't willing to pass down the faith. They weren't willing to pass down the faith. Most of us that sit in this room tonight would qualify to be in that generation of either Joshua's generation or the next generation down. We're, we're in one of those, two, that's kind of where we're at right now. We got some younger ones in here. We've got some little ones in here. And they don't know anything yet. They're a blank slate. And they're, they're waiting for you, mom and dad, to write some things on them. Listen, the preacher can say all he wants until he's red in the face, until he's blue in the face. But if it's not backed up at home, it doesn't amount to a hill of beans. Oh, there might be one or two that gets it. But the vast majority will turn their sights out of here and they'll walk out of those doors and never to darken the door of a, of a church again uh, or to, uh, I should say, a Bible preaching church again. And they'll go off into the world and we'll sit back and say, what happened? What happened? We didn't take the time. We didn't take the time to invest and to make sure and do all we could and to make sure as we rose up and as we sat down. And listen, I understand some make their own choices and you can do all that you can, but let it never be said it's because we dropped the ball. Let it never be said that it wasn't because we were not active in trying to make sure things got written in their hearts and make sure they got a hold of what was the truth here. Listen, Joshua, they, they watched great things. Can, you read the book of Joshua and you see the amazing miracles that God did. Uh, walk around a city seven times and the walls come tumbling down. That's amazing. Have a hornet, the first murder, murder hornets on record killing all those people out there, uh, driving them out there, uh, God putting the, the sun to stand still, uh, stop, hey, stop the earth, just, just put it, sit still for a day. Amazing things that God did. God did unbelievable things for Joshua. They watched those things. They watched the Jordan River, not just part, but pile up. What an amazing thing to see. They watched that happen. Listen, their eyes beheld wondrous things that God did. They didn't think it was a big deal to tell the next generation. What is it that you have seen God do? What is it that you've seen God do on your behalf? Listen, I would pray specifically in my life here, uh, to, if I had children, I would be praying, God, answer specific prayers so I can point them to my kids so my kids can see, hey, look what God did. Look what God did. For them, hey, look how God answered this prayer. Hey, look how God provided for us. Look, hey, you prayed for this here in particular. And look what God, hey, God answered your prayer. You watch their faith grow. You listen, you want your kids' faith to grow. You let them know what you're praying about. And let God do a work. Let God answer some of their prayers along the way. Because here's the thing. You tell them to believe God, they'll, they'll believe God. That's why God tells we have to come with a childlike faith. 
Because listen, a child believes that anything is possible. You tell them that they can make this earth stop, okay, I believe you. If God can do that. That's why I love, you know, when you're teaching the Word of God, and you're, you're telling those kids uh, things there, you know, uh, down there in, in, in those little uh, guys' classes or in, in junior church, and you start telling them, and you start painting the picture for them what God did, and you watch the eyes get big. Like, whoa, really? I love seeing that. I'm watching that childlike faith, and then you tell them that that same God is alive today, and he can do that kind of thing for you too. Or do you believe that? Do you believe that? The next generation needs to have somebody to lead them in the right direction. Listen, it's important here tonight. Just let me give you just a few things that we need to do. First off here, for those who are leading, whether it's the pastor, the deacons, the Sunday school teachers, the dads, the junior church leaders, whoever it is, if you are leading in any way, shape, or form, you need to make sure you have the right focus. Listen, don't get distracted. Listen, with this world, it is, it is full of distractions. I was driving down the road and I almost got hit head on by a a semi truck coming into uh, uh, to the church yesterday morning, coming on 49. The guy had swerved completely over into our lane. I hit the brakes and I went off the side of the road there just to avoid missing him. My wife, I don't know if she saw it or not, she was looking in the mirror there. I think she thought I was going crazy. But I watched that logging truck. He was all the way on my side of the road and I, I hit the brakes and I thought for sure I was dead. As he went by, I saw the phone being dropped down. Listen, 49 is not a place you want to be playing on the phone to begin with, but especially if you're driving a logging truck. It could have been as simple as this. Somebody sent him a text message. Easy. Just real quick. It wasn't going to be a long time, but it almost became a big deal. You understand we lose focus with what the Lord wants us to do with our kids. We'll lose the next generation. We've already almost lost the next generation. So listen, mom and dad, you got to be on purpose. You got to lead on purpose. And you got to lead in the right direction. And you got to lead towards the Lord. Grandma and grandpa, you get a chance to get them in there. I know you want to spoil them. Have a good time with that. But make sure you point them to the Lord. Make sure you tell them how you've seen God work in your life. Make sure you've got something to pass down to them because you want them to be able to say, I remember what Grandpa told me about God and what he did. And I'm going to trust my Grandpa's God. I'm going to trust my Dad's God. And I'm going to follow their example. Listen, leadership, those who are in front, you got to be like Joshua. I don't know what everybody else is going to do. But as for me and my house, this is what we're going to do. And then lead. It's important. It's important that the followers make the Bible integral to their life. In other words, the Bible is not just a Sunday morning thing. If your Sunday morning routine is like an Easter egg hunt to find the Bible, we got problems. I know we can use the phone and I know we can use the iPad and we can, we've got electronic devices all over the place, but there's something about just sitting down and having this open. I have some, I have an app on my phone, I listen to the Bible, but the Bible sits here next to me at my, in my office looking on, looking on it as well. Listen, it just, just having something there so they see that that book is open, it just, it, it helps them understand this here. Hey, mom and dad say it's important, well, I'm going to make it part of my life then too. And listen, kids, listen, young people, the Bible can't just be something we do on Sunday. It can't just be our Wednesday night thing. It just can't be the quiz time for, for camp. We've got to make sure it's a part of everything that we do. That's why I want you to have devotions every day. That's why I want you to take time to walk with the Lord. That's why I want you to take time to, 
to be with him. And that's why I don't want you just to rely on the pastor or rely on the youth director or to rely on the Sunday school teacher or whoever else it is that you're getting the Bible from, but that you have a personal walk yourself because you need God every day of your life and he needs to become integral to your life. But this is important though. It's important that the next generation sees and knows that the Lord is real and worth following. It's important that he see that they see it's real. When I was in high school, <laughs> I watched the Lord do some things in this place. I saw God do some amazing things. Yeah. And I can remember it plain as day. I can remember as a teenager coming in this auditorium on during the day and we had revival services going on at night. And I can remember some of those guys coming in here and skipping lunch to come in here and just pray. And watching God do some things in this place. It was awesome to see. I remember as a, as a youth pastor going to camp with our young people <coughs> and being so burdened for them. Because at the beginning of the week, we had a bunch of them make a pact amongst themselves that they would not make a decision for the Lord that week. I don't know how I found out about it, but somehow or the word got back to me midweek. I was so burdened for that. And I was driving, I was driving one of the um, carrier vans, I guess, where it was loaded down with all the luggage. And all of our kids were up in the, in the blue bus. I think that's part of why God broke that blue bus down for a couple hours. Because by the time we hit New Jersey, and we had, trying to go through all the maze of construction they had going on up through there. It was, a, it was a mess. But I remember my cell phone rang. And I opened it up and uh, I think Heather was, I think Heather might have been in there with me. And I had her answer the phone and she turned it on. And one of the ladies up there said, we got to pull off. You've got to get up here. You've got to get in the bus with us. I'm like, I, I can't. I'm driving. I'll catch up when we get to Connecticut. So as we pulled in the, in the parking lot of the bus, or in the church parking lot, climbed on the bus, and there was just a bunch of weeping. God, I broke through on the bus on the way home. And I watched God answer some prayers that day. And our kids watched God do a move and get in there. And what was leaving out on a Monday and watching just the hardness, and now we're going to fight God all week, and we're going to fight God all week. By the time we're driving home Friday and we're pulling in the, butt at the church parking lot after midnight. And kids, instead of going to run to their, their vehicles, their mom and dads, instead they're gathered around little groups out there in the middle of the parking lot praying with each other and getting right with each other. And just and moms and dads are standing back and saying, what in the world's happening? And we're sharing a little bit of what we knew on this here going on and some of the others who are on the bus sharing watching what God did, and that just, that just sent a wave through our church of just people getting right with one another. It was awesome to see God answer some prayers like that. Our folks got to experience, they got to see it, and there's so many other places along the way, along this journey, I've watched God do some wonderful, great things, and I am thankful for the testimonies that I can share of watching God do great and mighty things but I don't want it just to be my testimonies. Yeah. I don't want Brother Lucas just to have testimonies and Brother Danny just to have testimonies and Sister Karen just to have testimonies. And I go around to all the adults in here. We've watched God do some things. I want Levi to come back and have some testimonies. I want EJ to have some testimonies. I want Colt to be able to hang on to some things there. And so that whenever 20 years down the road and he's struggling, he's discouraged, and he's wondering, he can go back and revisit some of these spots along the way. He can go back to the Jordan River. He can see that pile of stones once again and say, I saw God do some great things back then, and I know my God is still real, and he can still do it today. He did it back then. He can do it today. I want them to have those same things. But listen, there's going to be, have to be some of the previous generation lead the way and be willing to sacrifice some things so they can see it happen. Psalm 63, if you turn there and real quick with me, we'll wrap up. <coughs> 
want you to see the first six words of Psalm 63. O oh God, Thou art my God. David's father had an awesome testimony for the Lord. The Bible talks about him that when it came to Jesse, when he came through town, everybody knew that that's a man of God right there. David's great-grandfather had a wonderful testimony. Boaz was known as a godly, godly man. But it wasn't enough for Boaz to have a testimony that it was his God. It wasn't enough for David that his dad had a testimony that it was his God. And I assume probably Obed also was probably known as a man of God himself too. David said, I'm not satisfied with that. He's got to be my God. Oh, if we could just take possession of God tonight and instead of being satisfied that this was my dad's God, my grandpa's God, this was Brother Parker's God. This was so-and-so's God. Other great saints who have been in this place and have gone on, instead of saying that it was their God, for us to be able to say, it's my God. And I've watched my God work on my behalf, and I know my God can do it. We used to be a nation that believed and followed God. Now, there's been a generation that's dropped the teaching of the Lord as an important part of our society. We're watching our culture fall apart. If we're not careful, the Victory Baptist Temple will fall in the footsteps of our country. And if we're not careful, this church will turn its back on God too. There will always be a remnant. God's promised that there's always going to be a remnant. But if we're not careful, We'll watch this place vanish away. And we'll watch what once was a great place of the gospel being preached and a lighthouse being lit in this area. We'll watch it go dim, and eventually the Lord will remove the candlestick. Throughout history, we find groups like the Paulicians, Waldensians, the Anabaptists, who would rather suffer persecution by the ruling parties of the day than to compromise the Word of God. There are forerunners to us as Baptists. There have been blood spilled in defense of what is right according to the Word of God. Men like Tertullian, Peter Waldo, Obadiah Holmes, Baltazar Hubemeyer, and a host of others who were willing to stand in the face of growing opposition and persecution and hand down their legacy to the next generation. They were part of a remnant who held true to the ways of God. The question is tonight, will we... Will we be willing to hand it down to our children? Will we be willing to hold on to this like those men did and hand it to our grandchildren so that they can go on as well? Will we do the same? Will we stop being distracted and get our focus back on the things that God would have us focus on? They're watching. They're waiting to see which way we'll take them. Let's do all we can to make sure that the next generation gets the message. Father, help us tonight.